Hi guys, this is Chris with Microsoft again with another exciting episode of What's New in Windows Server 2012. Apologize, it's been about a month since I uh, last did any of these uh, little episodes and it's just been kind of a wild month actually and so I apologize. I know I said that I'd be back in about a week and it's been way more than a week. So anyway, back to doing some What's New in Windows Server 2012 videos for you. Um, good news is I'll, I'll have some other projects coming up as well um, after this one is complete. But wanted to talk a little bit about Hyper-V. So in the next few episodes more than likely we'll probably talk about some of the different stuff that has happened as far as changes to Hyper-V. Um, just overall kind of looking first off at the the um, uh, the way Hyper-V looks switching back to an older uh, 2008 R2 box you can see that overall we really don't have a whole lot in in the way of the GUI enhancements so there's there's been some subtle changes um, so I'll try to kind of point those out to you but overall we'll still have kind of the same look and feel for the most part you've got your Hyper-V server right here and then you've got the virtual machines running on that Hyper-V server uh, underneath that. So just like before, you can connect to other uh, Hyper-V servers. So I think I've got another one out here that I, I've been uh, getting rid of a lot of machines in this environment, uh, doing a reload. So I want to say I have Contoso Host 3 maybe still online. Let's check real quick and see if I can connect to it. Um, if not, I'll uh, I'll do that again at a later point. But the the point is, if you have multiple Hyper-V servers in your environment, you can manage them all from the Hyper-V manage manager just before. Whichever one you have selected here will be whatever VMs you have uh, running over in that Hyper-V server. Below that, yeah, I'm afraid of that. So here in a little bit, we'll uh, we'll actually Contoso host one needs to be rejoined to Contoso.com. So I'll uh, get it rejoined and then uh, we'll attach to its Hyper-V server. So anyway, the virtual machines are listed here. Below this would be snapshots. So that's not really much of a change from the older. So you can see the snapshots that were in any of the uh, virtual machines that were running below that. Obviously, I don't have any of those on my 08R2 box, but I've got several snapshots on these. Uh, below that, we've got kind of a status window. These tabs are new, so this memory tab shows you dynamic memory and what it's using as far as assigned and what the current memory pressure or what we call memory demand is. Um, if you have anything special like SRIOV networking, you can see all of that here. Since I don't have that turned on, we've got uh, just some standard networking stuff. We'll talk about replica later. And if we had a replica server, this would be a good quick status screen. There's two ways you can see health of replica. Uh, over on the right, you'll see that we've renamed this from Virtual Network Manager to Virtual Switch Manager. But opening it up, you can see we can still create external, internal, and private networks. We'll talk about some of the property pages and how those have changed. The Hyper-V settings screen itself has gone through a little couple of changes. Let me kind of put a side-by-side -side comparison to 08R2. If I could hit the right button, that might help a lot too. So let me just keep on hitting the wrong button repeatedly because that's fun for everyone to watch, right? All right, so as you can see, little changes here and there, nothing extreme. Uh, go ahead and pull those over so we can kind of talk about a few of these things. You'll notice first off, down towards the bottom, we used to have these user credentials and delete save credentials. We've changed the security model. Uh, this works just a teeny bit differently now. In 08R2, what you'll find is on the local machine, actually, let's uh, let's just do it this way. Ooh, even a better way, we'll use one of our new shortcuts. So let's do our Windows key X, and then we'll follow Windows key X by, um, oh, 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 I'm remote desktop in. That, that's not going to work. So we'll do it in the way that I do when I'm remote desktop in. So kind of right clicking, going into manage, and tools, we can go into uh, computer management. Then we'll, uh, we'll go in here to the local users and groups. So a new group that we have under Hyper-V is going to be Hyper-V administrators. So we can come in and add people directly in or groups directly in to be a Hyper-V administrator without necessarily having to be administrator of the entire box. If this is joined to the domain, you'll also find that uh, there's a Hyper-V administrators group in Active Directory as well. As a matter of fact, let's just real quick pull over our domain controller uh, and take a look at Active Directory. Oh, that's already up. So we'll go in here. that I was 
was using just fell asleep on me. I'm going to go wake that up real fast. That's good. Oop, hello. A device manager. Um, okay, so under build 10, so we've got this counterpart, the Hyper-V administrators group on the domain. So by marrying these two together, we have changed the administrative model, although we still have as man or uh, authorization manager, as it uh, is often called, is still around. This is going to be kind of the easier way going forward to manage this sort of thing. So we we don't have to use the uh, save credentials in piece because we've we've saved uh, we've changed the way all that works. So again, kind of side by side comparison. So we've still got where you can default to your VHDs and VHDX files. We'll talk about how that's changed where the virtual machine configuration uh, XML files get saved. Uh, new spanning you know, is uh, pretty much still the same kind of property page here. Is there any way I can get that just a little further over so I can kind of show these together? So not not a lot of changes there. Uh, GPUs have been added. So if there were any graphical processors or GPUs on this box, I could assign them here. Let's say that I wanted to create an RDS or a uh, remote desktop services or a remote app deployment and take advantage of things like uh, remote FX. I could take the GPU and assign it to Hyper-V here. So that's what that does for me. Um, some of the new property panes in here are this. Let me see if I can get this back where it kind of fits well into the screen capture. There we go. So we have a uh, live migrations, which by default looks just like this, unchecked and unenabled. Live migrations allows us to move from uh, one Hyper-V server to another Hyper-V server without having to be in a cluster. So if I take a virtual machine and need to send that from one Hyper-V host to another, I can do that directly now. By default this is turned off, but you can turn it on by checking this box. By default it turns that to 2. There's no limit to how high you can set this effectively. It's really kind of just how much your hardware can handle. The default is Kerberos, but you could use PKI. Uh, there's a couple use cases, scenarios. Some people do not join their Hyper-V boxes to a domain and would prefer to use certificates. If you wish to do that, that's fine. If you have it joined to a domain, it doesn't necessarily have to be the domain that the VMs are in, uh, but there needs to be some sort of an authentication mechanism. So Hyper-V host 1 and Hyper-V host 2, if they're both in the same domain, as long as you have this right here, it'll work. Um, Highly recommended if you have multiple networks that you can use to uh, segment your traffic. If you do anticipate using uh, live migrations for your uh, virtual machines frequently, uh, segment that out. Maybe even something as simple as uh, carrying that over to a different VLAN uh, just to keep the network traffic uh, apart. Otherwise, you can just leave it on a flat network like this. Also, there's a new property pane called Storage Migrations. Storage Migrations move your virtual machine's storage from one uh, drive to another, or from one drive out to an SMB3 file share, if, if you wish. And by default, this is turned on, and by default, it is uh, set to 2, but you can push that up to as much as you think that your hardware can allow. Replica configuration is also turned off by default, so when you see it, it'll look grayed out like this. Replica is something we'll go into details uh, about later, but just know that this is where you come and turn it on. And you can use Kerberos, you can use uh, uh, some certificates to do this. Down at the bottom, you have the ability to allow replicas from any server or you can do that in a, uh, a segmented manner like star.contoso.com and then send those to different locations depending on where you uh, have those go. So these are the property pages. This is just you know the segmentation of the, uh, the way things have actually changed inside of the uh, just the property pages for the Hyper-V host itself. There's been a few changes as well under the virtual machines. So looking at the settings, you can see that pretty much, once again, very similar as far as the way these kind of look. So if I go into settings for this, a lot of the same kind of look and feel here uh, from 08R2. So uh, there are some subtle differences, though, so let's talk about a few of those. For one, under Add Hardware, you'll notice that we have a new one called Fiber Channel Adapter. This will allow you to combine this over here with this virtual SAN manager. If I had a fiber channel SAN and I had some, uh, 
had some uh, uh, zones that had been given to this guy via that fiber channel sand. My little lab didn't quite have that kind of budget, but um, I could take a section of those fiber channel ports and I could segment them out and create a new fake SAN uh, inside of the Hyper-V server and then I could go into the properties for that how about I go to the properties not to the virtual machine connection I could add this so now there's a fiber channel adapter on that VM and as far as it's concerned it will actually see an HBA card and then I can connect it to that SAN uh, go ahead and close the property page out. I don't think it had actually enumerated it by the time I created that. So let's go in and create a new fiber channel adapter and now connect it to our fake SAN. And there we go. So that's a new piece that we have under the hardware tab, tab uh, that wasn't there. We also have a change in virtual memory. So the uh, dynamic memory that came about on uh, server 2008 R2 uh, post service pack we had the ability to go into dynamic memory so very similar looking property pages but they are actually not the same so turning on and off dynamic memory gives you the ability to uh, share memory uh, among several different virtual machines this isn't an oversubscription of RAM similar to VMware and how they do their world uh, this would be still if I've got two terabytes of RAM on a machine and I've got tons and tons of virtual machines on that the host will leverage the physical memory as needed by monitoring the pressure of the network one of the integration services will actually be continuously watching for the uh, the memory pressure on your virtual machines and you have the ability to set your precedent on the weight which one of your virtual machines is more important than the others and if we have a high memory pressure situation going on on this VM for instance and it needs more RAM it can let the host know that and if the host has it to give it will give it and if it does not have it to give it will go take it from other virtual machines assuming that it is at a higher memory weight and they do not need the memory right now because those other virtual machines maybe have a lower memory pressure at that point in time something new also in this release is the ability to set your minimum RAM below the startup RAM so by doing so I can guarantee you will always have uh, at least 512 megs of RAM at startup Mr. Contoso MS1 by putting the startup RAM at 512 that way it'll give it uh, and maybe a more realistic number would be 1024 or, or so yeah that's good with that uh, and then I can say later hey you know but if once you get up and running if you don't need this memory anymore you need to release that back to the host uh, if, uh, if other virtual machines need that so we can actually set this lower now with that comes the uh, probability that occasionally you won't have memory so if the virtual machine is turned off and you don't have this much memory to give it just will not give it um, it won't start that virtual machine the one problem that conceivably could happen is if you tried if you'd uh, really really over subscribed your host and you had run completely out of memory then you could be in a situation where you couldn't reboot this host why couldn't you reboot it? Because you don't have the memory to be able to do that. So what we have now is the uh, smart paging file location. This is a temporary existence of RAM that would be really just uh, emulated addresses on a balloon file or a page file or a swap file as it's often uh, called. So what the host would do is it would create a file at this location then what it would do is it would uh, come back around and, and uh, in this location create a file that would be only used temporarily as we reboot this virtual machine this wouldn't happen on a startup operation but on a reboot operation if we don't have enough memory to back this one gig that we've told it that we have to have um, it would create 512 megs and then it would uh, or whatever it needs to be able to uh, to get a, a reboot operation started so could be anywhere between 512 megs and and a gig after the file has been created it will emulate pages of RAM similar to the way VMware does whenever you oversubscribe a VMware box but the nice thing about this is as soon as this guy gets up and running he's gonna rip those uh, bits and bytes off and it's gonna delete that file so I wouldn't think that anything would ever exist in this smart paging Damn it, why does that computer keep falling asleep sorry um, this smart pa uh, paging file location for more than about 10 minutes is about all you'd, you'd see there so those are your changes as far as this goes we um, 
we do have some changes here in processor. Oops, there we go. So uh, we still have the compatibility tab. It's changed a little bit. So over here, it was a checkbox. The pr processor compatibility is now kind of its own little subsection there. Uh, this doesn't mean go from AMD to Intel. Uh, this is more like an architecture change inside of the same uh, revision number. So going from like Nehalem to something later, uh, you wouldn't be able to. Uh, you would you would kind of lower the the instruction sets compatibility matrix so that they can move around without blasting it. Um, Numa, on the other hand, is uh, kind of a new little feature here. What we're uh, what we're really talking about here is the capability of your machine to understand at least a part of the architecture of the physical host, so that when the thread dispatcher goes and kicks off. Uh, jobs and moves the DLLs and XEs and the working set of your processes up into RAM, it will move them into the NUMA nodes uh, to the same virtual processors that the host is using that would match the host's DIMM slots that go along with those NUMA nodes so we don't have the cache coherent interchange bus becoming this big saturated pipe of trying to execute a code across it. So this is a whole lot more efficient than uh, some of our previous versions. This is uh, pretty good stuff actually. Someday in the future, I'll, I'll probably put together a quick little 10-minute video to really kind of outline NUMA architecture, uh, so that makes sense, because it's really becoming a good subject for SQL people and those who manage our hypervisor environments, uh, because it's not too uncommon for uh, the working set of a virtual machine or a database to cross a NUMA node. Uh, just because the working sets are getting so big, the workloads have, have really gone up. Okay, so not really a lot of changes uh, until we get down to network adapter. So now we have this um, this capability to allow for bandwidth management. So this is kind of like quasi QoS, if you will. You can give like a minimum guaranteed amount of bandwidth, um, and then you can also cap a, a certain amount of bandwidth per VM. So once again, we are looking at the virtual machine settings and and going through the uh, the property pages for this. So this virtual machine would carry this uh, configuration around with it. So uh, that would be uh, that would be one of the new neat little neat little features we have. Each virtual machine also comes with some of our uh, per VM uh, turn it on turn it off type capabilities for some of the new hardware acceleration features uh, like VM queuing if your NIC supports uh, virtual machine queuing uh, this can be turned on or off per VM. And then uh, same thing for IPsec task of offloading. So if your network card has the capability to take the load off of the uh, the host for any uh, encryption that's running on your network, then you would turn that on here. And also SRIOV capable network cards. I'll do another feature, uh, time permitting, in the feature. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll do an SRIOV IOV plus uh, NUMA node. Uh, talk just for people who actually want to dig in and actually understand some more of this. But single root IO virtualization is really dependent on whether your network card supports it. If it does, you can turn that on and off per VM. So we also have the ability to uh, do some of the stuff that we've done before as far as spoofing MAC addresses and whatnot. Uh, you can keep this virtual machine from becoming a DHCP server or a router by checking these boxes right here. Uh, you could do mirroring mode here, so if we want to do some uh, promiscuous scanning and stuff like that. want to uh, do NIC teaming inside the host, you can check this box as well. We talked about NIC teaming in another video, and so this would be where we could turn that on. And honestly, as far as what's new in Windows Server 2012, that covers a lot of the VM-specific stuff and the Hyper-V host-specific stuff. Uh, the virtual switch manager has undergone a little bit of a change. For one thing, of course, it used to be called the virtual network manager, and so we've renamed it. Internally at Microsoft, what has happened is the, the folks that run the Hyper-V development uh, used to be in charge of the network uh, development. Now it's all kind of handled by a different team that does nothing but network development, so that's actually kind of cool. So anyway, we still can create internal, external, and private networks. So if you're familiar with um, these concepts, obviously the private network is something that only the VMs themselves that were attached to that could see. Internal means that the host is also playing in that ballpark now. External means we can see the outside world. Uh, some of the advanced features that have occurred now with the, uh, the switches themselves, right over here uh, under 
my switch, there's this new thing called extension. So now we have Indus and WFP opened up. Uh, so I've got a screenshot around here somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. Um, let me pause the video and you find this. I don't have the money to buy a, like a Cisco Nexus switch for my Hyper-V environment. Um, and that's been a real popular feature for those people who are big VMware fans. Uh, we now have the capability for that uh, to occur. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can find a screenshot. So one of my colleagues actually got this up and running. So uh, he has a screenshot from his. So let me just let me just throw a little quick screeny in from a colleague of mine here. So as you can see, this is a screenshot of uh, how someone has taken a virtual switch extension and thrown the Cisco Nexus switch into the matrix here. So using uh, using some of these advanced features you, you would now be able to do that contact Cisco obviously for something of that nature uh, some things I, I, I probably should have hit right up front but I really didn't go into with some of the details and the capacity changes that's some of the exciting story but it's not really anything I can just show you right in here because honestly um, those are kind of the uh, the things you would need big 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 super duper powerful servers um, to be able to demo and I don't have big big super powerful servers but let me just talk real quick about some of the the capacity and scaling changes as far as uh, Windows Server 2012 um, so logical is a process support you could do uh, 320 logical processors you uh, now have the ability to, to, to hold up to four terabytes of physical memory at the host. Uh, you could hold up to, uh, if you wanted to cluster this, if you wanted to create a high avail available cluster um, and you wanted to have a whole bunch of nodes in that cluster, you could have up to 64 nodes in that now, which uh, before it was about 16. And you could have up to 8,000 virtual machines running in one cluster, whereas in the past you couldn't have more than about 1,000. So. Um, 32 virtual processors. Each virtual machine would be able to uh, have up to a terabyte of RAM. Um, that live migration, again, that's that's a, a huge that's a huge change because uh, there's no limitation to that now. Whatever your hardware can support. So, uh, same with that storage migration. Whatever you think you can do. Um, so anyway, the the whole virtual processor to loss, logical processor ratio that's pretty well gone now. Uh, just whatever you whatever you can put in there. So um, anyway, I'd forgotten to mention the scalability, so I thought I'd throw that in there real quick while I was thinking about it. Uh, oh, you know what else? I have a screenshot of. Here, let me let me pull this up here too. No, let's not do that in Mark. Um, here's a screenshot also of what it looks like when you actually have some GPUs. My server. Quit that. That my servers don't have uh, GPUs, but if I wanted to attach, say, an ATI Radeon 500 and make that for remote FX capability, here's a screenshot of somebody who's done that as well. So, uh, thought I'd, th I'd throw that out there for you as well. Another thing, another thing that's kind of cool is the. Um, you know, we've we've always had this, right? You double click it, and you can see your uh, virtual machine connection. Uh, pull up. There's a lot of different ways you can you can connect to server by clicking the connect button there. And there's a lot of ways to get this, but it's not actually coupled to the Hyper-V manager. So with everything closed down, I just want to show you that I have the capability here to uh, go in here and launch the Hyper-V virtual machine connection right off uh, uh, the start menu there. So you can type in the name of the, the Hyper-V server and then type in the name of the uh, what is this guy? Is he is he host to? Uh, yeah, he is. Okay, so he's being a little bum. Maybe if I go back to doing local host, he'll enumerate the VMs for me. Nah, he's wanting to be kind of. Uh, I don't even remember what I called that other guy. Was it DC2, Contoso DC1? All right, so let me uh, let me type that in there. DC1. So local class, you don't have the required permission. Okay, so here comes the cool part. So I don't have the permission for this. This is something you can give and take away on a uh, per user basis. Though so I'm not really sure why I don't have the uh, access to do that. But let me uh, let me get my handy dandy uh, zoom in thing going here, and uh, we'll we'll type the. Oh, I bet that doesn't come through on the video when I zoom like that. Um, yeah, my zoom it isn't going to zoom and still be able to capture the video, so you're gonna have to uh, 
you're going to have to just kind of squint your eyes there a little bit or maybe move that to your high def mode. So two things that come with this um, is the ability to, let me, let me just say, if you have shadow IT, which is a funny way of saying, if you have an IT department, but then you have like, let's say your HR department has their own kind of uh, semi-quasi IT guy, <laughs> a lot of companies have this problem. Or, or let me say, in some cases, not necessarily a quote-unquote problem, but a uh, just a couple of rogue IT people that don't really belong to the IT department. What you could do if you need to give somebody complete access to a virtual machine, but not actually give them access to the Hyper-V server, uh, to give them the capability to maybe shut off the box or turn it, uh, restart it and stuff like that, and uh, and do a, instead of a remote desktop connection like I'm doing here, but instead doing the virtual machine connection, like what we're doing here, what you can do is do a grant, how about I type R-A-N-T, uh, VM connect, let's see if it'll tab to complete for me here, grant VM it would if I probably typed it right, VM connect access, and then we're going to type in the uh, VM name, and that's Contoso DC1, and then um, username is going to be Kyle, and so he's got access now. Let's see if that fixes this problem, or if it's actually a problem that I have with Let's see. Oh, and here's the other thing that I wanted to show you was VM Connect is actually where you can hit it from the command line. So I could do that with a graphical user interface, or I could actually create a shortcut maybe and put these parameters in there. So uh, server name is the first parameter that you could type in past uh, VM Connect. So I think if I do a question mark, it'll show me all of those. Yeah, there we go. So server name and then. Uh, the uh, uh, VM name and everything. So let's type that VM connect and then we're Contoso host one. Watch this not work because it's not working when I'm trying to do it from the GUI. Contoso DC one. See if that, oh, hey, without the backslash might help. Actually, let's see what it does. Seems to be thinking about something here. Something launched. Well, just while we're waiting on that one to fail, let's see if I can get this one to work here, or if it's going to tell me I just don't have the access. Uh, so where I could see this being useful to you guys is if, if maybe you have a user and you, you want to install the Hyper-V management tools and then maybe come in here and take away the... Oh, I don't even have mine on here. <laughs> so you know, HYP Hyper-V manager unpin it from their start menu and not have it where they can see it and then create a shortcut and then type that same thing right say we're going to do vm right. host one dc1 and then and then you've got yourself a nice handy little shortcut and then say shadow shadow it there you go and we get this guy uh, the ability to just kind of log straight into that. So I actually think I inadvertently shut off my DC when we were playing with it earlier. That's probably why we're not uh, getting authentication on this at the moment. So not a really big deal. The point is for you to be able to see what it is that I'm uh, 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 getting at for as far as the, the changes to the VM connection or the virtual machine connection property. Yeah, sure enough, it's failing. Uh, RPC server's not running, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but that's cool. Mostly, I just wanted you guys to see the interface. So, I have way made this uh, video too long. I may actually have to split this up into two parts. In the in the uh, coming parts for what's new in Hyper-V, I'm going to show you Hyper-V Replica. Um, I'm also going to kick off some, um, uh, some Hyper-V... Uh, uh, we're going to move some stuff around, so I'm going to do live uh, migration and stuff just to... Uh, kind of cover all the stuff that's that's really changed in Hyper-V, but uh, I think probably at the moment we're, we're getting a little long for this video, and if there's one bit of feedback that I'm getting either via uh, the YouTube or any of the other places I put these videos up on, uh, any of the common uh, feedback that I, uh, I get from you folks is try to keep it a little bit more succinct and don't talk so that much. And you have to, you'll have to forgive me when I'm not out doing the, uh, being a premier field engineer uh, thing I teach workshops and uh, I do that
quite frequently all over the world, actually. Uh, so I'm used to being in front of a classroom for three, four, five days, and I get anywhere from uh, 24 to 40 hours worth of people getting <laughs> talks. So I don't have to be quite as succinct as I am with YouTube, but again, I'm rambling on. So anyway, guys, this has been Chris with Microsoft, and as always, thanks for watching. If you did find anything about this useful, please give it a quick like and the link below, and feel free to subscribe to my channel. Also, my blog is at 9z.com. It's really super easy to remember, just this last number and then the last letter of the alphabet. Dot com. That's also got links to my Facebook, my LinkedIn, my Twitter. Uh, so again, thanks a ton for listening, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.